companies spend over $20 billion on sales training every year. But if you ask the average rep how they learn to sell, the answer is almost always not training, but rather a great coach. This October, we're going to prove the value of sales coaching once and for all by finding the best sales coaches in the world. Introducing Top Sales Coach 2020, hosted by Ring DNA and the Sales Enablement Podcast with Andy Paul. This is your chance to win the prestige of being named a top sales coach, a $1,000 grand prize, and the opportunity to receive feedback from some of the top sales leaders and coaching experts in the world. Enter the competition in three easy steps. Step one, choose one of three pre-recorded sales calls at topcoach.ringdna.com. Step two, record a one to two minute video coaching the rep from your call of choice. Step three, submit your video and wait for the votes to start rolling in. Go to topcoach.ringdna.com and battle for the sales coaching crown. Guided selling from RingDNA makes your entire sales team more effective by revealing exactly what reps should do and when to do it. Guided selling works by transforming sales data into a curated list of prioritized sales actions. So when reps start their day, they'll never again wonder which prospects and accounts or hot inbound leads to reach out to next. Guided selling even shifts reps' priority in response to real-time buying signals. Finally, even new reps can sell like seasoned ones. Let RingDNA be your guide to success. Learn more at ringdna.com slash guided selling. That's ringdna.com slash guided selling. I don't buy that. I think that for me, if you're not likable, how are you going to get to more detailed conversations that are going to give you insight that you need to differentiate? I don't see how that works. And I'll tell you, again, with this pandemic, I mean, it's pervasive in what we're doing today. People are emotionally drained in this and your buyers are part of that group. So if you go in and you're kind of a bully or you're just, you don't have any concern about what their plight is or who they are, where they're at, and you are oblivious to that emotion and you're not likable, you're probably going to have a tough time to sell in regular times. But right now, no one has the capacity to deal with someone who comes in there is very, you know, self-serving and clearly there to sell you. Hi, friends. Welcome to the Sales Enablement Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Paul. Now, that was Anita Nielsen. Anita is the author of a book titled Beat the Bots, How Humanity Can Future-Proof Your Tech Sales Career which is a big challenge. In this episode, I talk with Anita about how to use your essential human qualities to build a foundation for future success in a more automated sales future. We'll talk about some of the big challenges facing sales professionals and uh, to do what Anita calls master human value and why when a seller delivers personalized human value, their prospects won't want to buy from a machine. We'll also dive into the topic of what it will take for a seller to be more relevant to their buyers than a machine and why, and if they do that, why they have nothing to fear from an AI future. All this and much, much more. Before we get to Anita, I want to remind you to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. And if you subscribe, we'd certainly appreciate it if you could also give us your feedback about how we're doing in the form of a review. So thank you. All right, let's jump into it. Anita, welcome to the show. Andy, it's good to be here. Well, that's <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> Glad you're at home here. We're going to have a good time, I think, today. So, um, where are you sort of sheltering in place these days? I am in the south suburbs of Chicago, a town called Frankfurt. Frankfurt? Yes. South suburbs. It's not that far, technically, but most people don't know where it is, which I'm glad. It's the best kept secret. It's the most quaint little town. Yeah, I to remember. My f- folks lived for a time years and years and years ago, actually, before I was born. In- Park oh. Forest. Yep, that's actually not. I don't think that's that far. Yeah, my dad I mean, used to take the nice. train into work downtown every day. There you go. Yeah, we have a really good train system, and I love it. We've got two stations here in Frankfurt, so it works out pretty well. Nice, nice. Well, we're going to talk about your book, uh, hey. Beat the Bots, How Humanity Can Future-Proof Your Tech Sales Career. Uh, it's not necessarily tech sales. I mean, it could be anybody's sales career, right? 
It could. That's a that's a good point. So I uh, I had to make a decision for the title of the book, and I I've got stories from technology because I've sold technology um, and supported sales in tech for about twenty some years, and so my stories are all related to that. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to call this tech, just so people can. Um, you know, people, tech people will know that these are their stories, right? Like cloud solutions and hardware, software, all of those things. But it does apply universally. So what was the impetus to write the book? So the impetus for this book was, um, you know, so I work very closely with salespeople. Uh, there was one, there was like the last straw that made me do it. I went on a customer call with one of my coaching clients. I'm an embedded coach, and I have the privilege of being able to actually sit with my clients when they're in a customer meeting, which is awesome. We had this meeting and it went really well. I, I mean, it wasn't ast- like astronomically well, but it did pretty good. We got out of there and we said, let's go debrief. And we went to a local bar and we had a couple drinks. And after the drinks start flowing, um, the sales rep that I was speaking with, I'm going to call him Neil, he just started to talk about you know real life and how his commission checks were not what they used to be. And it was getting harder and harder to differentiate. There's more customers buying, et cetera. So all these challenges that are happening for him in sales in a very real way. And his concern was, you know, I'm going to have to send my wife back to work. She hasn't worked in years. And uh, she's going to have to go back if things don't change. And my son is in a prestigious private school, and I'm going to have to pull him out. And so I'm hearing this, and I have a very sensitive empathy sensor. And it starts to go haywire because at that moment, it became very real for me that, sales is changing so much and not even thinking about the robots yet, but just differentiating and having multiple buyers making decisions. And it's impacting these human beings that I adore and that I support. So it was like, all right, you know what? Got to do it. Let's let's just get this done and let's hopefully reach as many as we can. Well, so what did Neil stop doing that he was doing before? Um, he hadn't. He hadn't stopped doing anything. I mean, he was following all of his principles. He was doing, you know, the right activity. I think it just came down to the fact that the place that the space that he was selling in, it wasn't that differentiated anymore. And he was having a difficult time doing the things that he used to do from a personalized value standpoint. I mean, it's not a world where you can, you know, go play golf and, um, you know, have steak dinners and, and that helps reinforce the relationship. It's much more, it's different than that. And there's more people involved, I think is probably the biggest change. So he was, he was still navigating how to work on that. And of course, I was coaching him through that. But yeah, it just, it, it, so much had changed. And I think the other big thing is, when you go in as a sales professional today, or I could say back then when I was talking to Neil, your customer already knows so much about you. I and mean, they've checked you out on LinkedIn. They know your company's webpage. They know what people are saying about you on Glassdoor. So you go in and you, it's a different conversation than these folks are used to having. They usually go in and give their um, you know, their pitch and their introduction. Now it's like, you know what? Customer says, I, I already know that. I've seen your website. Tell me what I don't know. And I've actually heard a customer say that. So those types of changes, I think, were really making a difference. Um, it's not overt. You can't see it right away. But that's, I think, what was at play. Well, it's sort of interesting. I mean, you know, just listening to how tell the story is that, um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like Neil just wasn't paying attention. I mean, it's not like these things happen overnight. I mean, these, and I might take issue with bits of the description because I'm not a huge, huge believer that, at least if you're selling complex deals, that, um, they're necessarily more stakeholders. I mean, it's always been, yeah, there may be more in quantity, but there's always been a complex deal. There's always been a lot of stakeholders involved in a decision. I was wondering, you know, this is maybe a broader question too, is, is, yeah, are people just paying attention? No, I don't think he, I don't think he had an issue with paying attention. I think it is difficult for people to change. So he knew some of these changes were happening, but there's a big difference between knowing that there's change and facing it and figuring out how to adapt for it. So there is a period of time in there. I think you know he he was still working on his skill set and how to do his research and how to have that powerful discovery conversation. So there was a lot of I mean, there's evolution happening real time at that moment. So it's not. I mean, I I, I hate to say that he was not paying attention because he absolutely was. He's actually one of the more diligent sales professionals that I've worked with. So it was more of a things are changing and I'm trying to keep up, but I, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, I mean. And I don't get down into the weeds at, at this point because yeah, we're going to cover some of this conversation. But it's, it's um, you know, you made the point about like discovery. So, in Neil's perspective, what changed about discovery? Just the fact he had to do discovery with a broader segment of people. 
No, no. The discovery was typically with your champion first, right? So in these types of complex sales, you meet with that one person, then you get to the broader audience. The discovery itself hasn't changed that much. I mean, there's ways that you can improve it, but the questions do change, right? Because when you are coming in to meet with a customer that's already done their research, they're assuming that you've done your research on them as well. So you better come in there with some really, really um, intelligent questions based on what you're seeing out there, for example, on social media or press releases, et cetera, which you know, I know you're going to say that that's something you had to do in the past, but it is more, it's more powerful now, the way that you have to look at that, um, you know, than I think it has been in the past. And maybe there's a little bit of, you know, people are having a difficult time catching up, but they're in the sales day to day. I mean, it's hard for them to keep their thumb on the pulse of all the different things that are happening and how others perhaps are selling that is more powerful or that's more convincing, et cetera. Okay. Well, let's, let's come back to that. Cause I, I think that's, that's worth exploring. Cause I, Again, I, I believe change is, is gradual, even though we've seen continuous change. I think it's still yeah. incremental. And, and you know, I think the challenge for sellers like Neil may be a little different than what you described, is, is but also part of what you described is, is he wasn't as relevant to them as he was before. He and wasn't. That's, he and that doesn't, I said, that doesn't happen overnight. That's something like, that's why it said, was he paying attention? Because I think this is this is you know there's always these these changes right that are sort of continuous change and I've yeah. experienced you know working with people who are just confounded by the changes you know in my course of my career four decades in sales I've seen it all um, I remember when it wasn't too long before I started working the fax machine was new so um, <laughs> so but I've I've seen people completely as I said just completely confounded by changes in the way we sell changes in you know going from you know analog to digital and right. and so on there's a lag i think i think what we're i think what i'm trying to say and, and maybe in the context of what you're saying is there's a lag right so if you're sitting here thinking i'm going to get irrelevant which a lot of salespeople were at that time because you know there's all these um, studies about how Bots are going to take jobs for, from salespeople, 50% of the jobs by 2020, et cetera. So you know that you are you have to become more relevant by the minute. But there's a lag between when you make that determination and then you recognize where you need to go. But we know it's a continuous evolution. So I don't think that you're ever at the point where you're exactly where you need to be and that you're the best well, seller. I agree. Ever. I agree. Absolutely. You know? So, yeah. So I think, there's a, I think there's a lag, and that's probably where I caught him. Well, yeah. And that, this, is I think, is a really critical point for salespeople is that – um, if you want a career in a long term career over the course of your own careers, is um, I use the word paying attention, but that's really what it boils down to is, is you know, you're so stuck in your own little bubble that these things are happening on around you, and suddenly you wake up one day and find out, oh, I've been left behind. That's right. And I think this is what happens to a lot of salespeople. You look at we got our 80 20 distribution, you know, I suppose the top 20% are doing 80% of the business. Well, if you're not, one of the top people is, is yeah, are you feeling this imperative to, to become one or at least to become proficient at what you're doing? Yeah, he was competent. He was proficient, but he wasn't at the point where he was unconsciously competent yet about what he was trying to do within the context of those complex sales. So, yeah, I, I totally get what you're saying. And it's just, it is, it's a situation where we have to adapt to change. And I think if nothing else, the situation that we're in right now with this pandemic and all of these things, that has made this at the forefront that you don't get to, um, you know, just sit around and expect that you're going to be able to have customer meetings face to face all the time, or that you're going to be able to do the th types of things that you did before. Maybe you hated Zoom. Maybe you never turned on the camera. Not an option so much anymore. So I think people are catching on. Well, yeah, and I think there's a, a big difference between something like the pandemic that happens that um, you know happens out of the blue and changes life as we know it pretty quickly, as opposed to. Yeah, this whole thing about AI and bots replacing salespeople. You know, Forrester is famous for theirs. You quoted the report: fifty percent of B two B sales jobs gone by twenty twenty. Well, it's twenty twenty, and right. actually, B two B sales employment's gone up. That's right. Indeed. So, so if you know, to that point is you know, this AI train is moving, but it's uh, what's the movie where I think maybe an Austin Powers movie where. Uh, you know, like the Zamboni machine, or not the Zamboni, but a uh, you know, 
a big roller, mechanical rolling machine, you know, rolling and the guys, roll him over. <laughs> yeah, rolls him over and he sees it coming from, you know, 50 yards away and is paralyzed to the spot and can't move. Right. I mean, it's sort of like that is, is, you know, change is coming, but even though it feels rapid in many respects, it's, there's time if you're paying attention to, to react and so on. But, but to the point of your, your book is, is, um, what do sellers really have to fear from AI? And what form do you think it's going to take that that forces them to change? Yeah, I don't think necessarily that all sellers need to be afraid. I think the sellers that need to be afraid are maybe the people that aren't doing more transactional sales, right? Anything that can be replicated that doesn't require you know human traits such as empathy or problem solving or critical thinking, those types of things I think are ready for robots, AI, machine learning, all of those things to take over. But what isn't is exactly what I just said, the things that require empathy, the things that require you to genuinely care about your customer, to have um, you know, the ability to have conversations with them that are focused on not just the business, but on them as human beings. Those types of things, I think it's we're not there yet where the technology is going to take over those things. And I'm, I'm thinking maybe not in our lifetimes, but we could be surprised. So I fear for the salespeople that are doing transactional sales that have gotten really comfortable and complacent almost in that. And they've got their shtick. They go out, they talk about features and benefits, and then that's how they think they're going to close the sale. Well, if you can get a machine or even a website to do that, you're, you're irrelevant pretty quickly. So I think that's that's the way that I look at it from, you know, there's technology disrupting the um, industry. And honestly, I haven't, none of the salespeople that I work with, which I don't typically work with transactional sales professionals, mm. Right. They're not. They're not directly. I mean, they're not sitting with this hanging over their head every single day. But you know, when you see reports like that, he's for Neil, for example. I mean, he reads things like that. A lot of salespeople don't, and so he knew that that was something that was out there. So he he was kind of afraid of that. So it's one of those things where you know some people are just walking through this oblivious, but some people get it, and they're trying to figure out how they make it work in the way that they sell today and how they're going to sell tomorrow. So. The key then for people who are in B2B sales, let's say, again, not transactional, working on more complex deals is, you know, title of the book, Future Proof, um, and based on <laughs> on humanity, which I think is is the right track. But what should people be looking at today and saying, okay, what steps can I take today and just sort of, you know, play with this, this theme of future-proofing my sales career? Yeah, I think simple skills like the discovery, for example, I think you have to get better at discovery. It's no longer a time where you can just go in and do, you know, regular old open ended questions that you're taught about in sales 101. You have to be asking the big questions, the kind of questions that give your customer the ability to, you know, show some emotion. Um, So and I joke about this, but only half heartedly questions a shrink would be jealous of. Right. You want to get in there and really give them the breath to be able to speak about where they're at not necessarily just in their role or with their company, but who they are as a person. Because I believe that is the place where you can differentiate is in that interaction between the seller and the buyer, that human-to-human connection. I I don't see how that gets um, commoditized, right, because it's two unique individuals. And so I say for sales reps, that's the kind of thing that they have to focus on is learning those things. And then the the other side of that is the um, active listening and being really, really good at hearing what that customer is saying and listening for things that are going to help you then create value that's differentiated for them. So it's it's not that you have to you know redo the types of activities that you do. You just have to look at them a little bit differently. And um, I think salespeople that ask questions like, can you help me understand, as opposed to, you know, what is X? They're the ones that are going to do better because they've enabled that customer to talk about just about anything that they want to, and, and where their mind goes is half of what you want to be paying attention to. Well, let's dig into that because you bring that up in the book in terms of those types of questions. So, explain where that fits serve in your hierarchy of your three value types. Yeah, so I look at generalized value, and generalized value is basically the value of whatever the product is. It's inherent in that product. One of the examples that's easy I like to give is a toothbrush. All toothbrushes exist to clean teeth, right? There's there's no variation depending on company to company of what a toothbrush does necessarily. Next up, you have the company value. And so the one that I like to think about for this is, you know, you could have an electronic toothbrush, for example, and multiple companies have it. Well, all of a sudden, Oral-B comes out with one that is, um, you know, attached to your phone by Bluetooth and you're able to see how long you're spending brushing your teeth. And that's pretty cool. And that's differentiated. But it, that differentiation is finite because lo and behold, three months later, you know, the competition is going to be doing the same thing. They're going to have that same type of product. 
So there's um, some differentiation at that level, but it's finite. It doesn't you know, last very long. It's just as long as the other people figure out how to copy it. And then um, you know, the next thing that you look at is personalized value. And this is where you're bringing it down to that human to human level. Personalized value is the way that a sales professional understands the needs and challenges and ideas of that customer on a very human level. When I say human level, it's not just what are the needs and challenges that they faced as that um, as the as the customer in that role, but as a human being. I mean, you, you want to be able to understand some of those motivations because that's where you're going to be able to find opportunities to truly differentiate, looking at what's unique about them, combining it with what's unique about you, and really putting some thought into how you're going to make a difference for them. And that's the differentiated value. It's personalized value. Okay. So, um, well, I mean, let's expand on that. So personalized value, where's that fit then into sort of the decision criteria the, the buyer has? Well, so the trick with the buyer is they're not going to come in there and say that I want you to sell to me personally at a human to human level. I mean, I don't think that's even on the buyer's radar necessarily, sure. unless they're being slimy, sneaky, shady about it, in which case they'll smell it a mile away. But I think from a buyer standpoint, if you can, as a sales professional, impact that buyer on a human level, then that immediately makes them more apt to want to buy from you. And it also makes them um, trust you more, obviously. It helps you to build that relationship much stronger. And what I found is when people do this and they use that personalized value, they end up with customers for life. So that customer can go to XYZ company five years from now, and they'll, the first, one of the first calls they'll make is to that sales professional because they knew that that person helped them be successful and had their back. I think that's one of the things I really like to say. Do your customers know that you have their back? and that you're there to help them win at what they're trying to win at. And so I think on the buyer's radar, I don't necessarily think that they're thinking that way. Well, no, but I'm saying is, is so in, in your mind is, so this is you know, very experiential, the personalized value you're talking about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, you know, how's that fit into when they're making their decision about, gosh, whether we want to go with company A or company B, how are they factoring that experiential uh, experience into their decision making? Yeah, and I think that that's I'm trying to that's what I'm trying to say. So it's not necessarily that there there's a you know like a, a matrix or a rubric where they categorize you know personalized value. It is personal. And so if I'm a um, CEO and I'm making a decision, and I, there's a company that I've worked with for years and years, and maybe the new team that I'm working with doesn't necessarily love that company, I'm still going to fight for that company. And I'm CEO, so I'm probably going to win. That's the kind of thing that. You, you keep on doing in your career and it comes back to you. So the buyer doesn't necessarily have some checklist that says, oh, they delivered personalized value. Th- that's not in there. It's about them recognizing that human being and in that process, in that experience, understanding that this person is doing a really good job of understanding me and anticipating the things that I'm going to need and um, helping me come up with creative ways to solve my problems. That is a type of mindset that that sale, that the buyer has, but again, that's not something that they're advertising. It's it is personal. Oh, I know that, but I, th- I think that there's actually been research done onto this is in terms of in the buyer's mind, what percentage of the decision is based on the experience of buying versus the product feature sets and the implementation, and all those other sort of tangible deliveries. Yeah, how important is the intangible versus the tangible? I think I think that the intangible is the most important because I believe that people buy on their emotions and they rationalize it, you know, later once they've made that decision. And sometimes it's a, it's a decision is very conscious. Sometimes it's subconscious, but they're making a decision in that moment in that experience. So I, I, I guess I'm not I'm not sure what your question is, but I think that's that's the difference. This isn't something that can be categorized. Yeah. Um, well, and so. That brings up another interesting point, which is, and we look at this idea of the importance of the human-to-human touch in sales, which I'm an absolute believer in, is, is, and we talk about this idea of the the importance of emotion in making a decision, is I wonder how much, and I don't know the answer to this, but just sort of a question popped on my mind, is, is when we have larger groups of stakeholders uh, involved in a decision is doesn't that tend then to mitigate the impact of emotion on the decision? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And I think to some degree it does. I don't think it eliminates it, but I do think that it puts some limits on it. And so in that situation, what you're doing is you're, you're in some ways, you're letting that relationship that you have with that one customer and on that group that's going to make the decision there, you're almost getting to the point with them where they're championing you, right? So they're advocating for you on their internal team. Um, and simultaneously, you should be trying to have some rapport and communication and creating some sort of a connection with the others on the team if you have access to them on that buying committee or what have you. So it's it's one of those things where there's typically that one solid personalized relationship and that can help facilitate that purchasing decision. So if that, you know, I think I read, I can't remember which book it was, but they called it like the bully with the juice, right? There's always mm-hmm. that person. Um, you know, that's in there and then it's really kind of driving the decisions and no one really knows what's happening with that. So it's mobilizing your buyer, the person that you're making that connection with to go in there and sell for you essentially and help you be the one that gets selected. And I, I mean, I've seen that time and again. Yeah. Well, and I've, absolutely. And um, I mean, you sort of refer to that in the book when you're um, story of the cherry candies and Jan is that you know the value of keeping it personal is that these intangibles differences don't have to be significant in order yeah. to work in your favor. Right, it's thoughtfulness, and I think it's hard. And here's the problem: this is mushy stuff, right? This is not something that you can put a metric to. And I think that's why sometimes people struggle with it. I mean, sales leaders have a difficult time really understanding how these things work. But at a very human level, the persons, the people that are connecting, it's very powerful. I mean, I think it's the most powerful thing. But um, it's it's that thoughtfulness, that just genuine concern and commitment to their success, the customer success. I think that you can't put a number or a metric on that, but it, I think it's the most powerful thing. What's well, interesting because you know there are some number of sales authors, sales experts um, who are saying just the opposite these days, that you know, this whole idea of a relationship is overblown, that you don't even need to be likable in order to win business. In fact, it may be working against you. I'm just yeah. interested in your take on that. I was going to say, I'm probably um, either subconsciously or deliberately not reading that kind of thing. I don't buy that. I think, <laughs> I think that for me, you know, if you're not likable, how are you going to get to more detailed conversations that are going to give you insight that you need to differentiate? I don't see how that works. And I'll tell you, I mean, again, with this pandemic, I mean, it's pervasive in what we're talking, what we're doing today. You know, people are emotionally drained in this and your buyers are part of that group. So if you go in and you're kind of a bully or you're just, you don't have any concern about what their plight is or who they are, or where they're at, and you are oblivious to that emotion and you're not likable, well, you're probably going to have a tough time to sell in regular times. But right now, no one has the capacity to deal with someone who comes in there and is very um, you know, self-serving and clearly there to sell you. I think there's a, there's a big difference. And I don't, I don't think that being unlikable is going to help you. But more than that, I think that customers are at a point where they can sense your intent as human beings. I think that most people can sense if someone is there to sell them or if someone's there to help them, and it's a it's a fundamental difference. Yeah, well, I don't. I agree because I, I don't think customers are ever under any illusion that you're there to get a, an order. But right. to your point, it's, yeah, how you go about it. And I think right. an interesting way I like to look at it is 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 there's a difference between we we train sellers to be persuaders. Where they really need to be influencers. Yeah, that's right. I think there's a, a huge difference. And you sort of refer to this a little bit in the book or implied is that, you know, persuasion, as much as I had a guest on the show not that long ago, written a book about this idea of how do you change people's minds and mm-hmm. said that research finds that, you know, people have a natural, I, I call it a cognitive bias against persuasion. You know, they, they resist it that's when right. they feel it. Um, this whole idea, I guess the old expression, you know, people don't mind buying, but they hate being sold. Exactly right. Yeah, interesting where you, how you see that playing out. Because I think this is one of sort of the, as you look at the role of automation going forward, is that it is going to be persuasive, but not influential. Meaning persuasion is just, persuasion has sort of a implication of coercion behind it to some degree. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, and uh Influence doesn't necessarily. Yeah, influence, if you look at the definition of the dictionary, is really about 
uh, having an effect upon somebody. I agree. I, I think what's tough is, um, you know, if I if I think about being able to you know just kind of sell somebody, I feel like if you're looking at persuasion in that context, someday there's going to be an algorithm that can mimic what these principles of persuasion are. I mean, it's tons of study done on that. So sure. maybe maybe a computer or a robot figures out, okay, have I have I done the scarcity um, conversation? Have I done you know X Y Z social proof, whatever that looks like? Mm-hmm. I, I don't see influence. I don't see turning into an algorithm because it's so gradual and it is so personal. How you influence a human being is a function of, of what motivates them and what matters to them. And until robots have the ability to understand that deeply and have empathy, I, I, don't, I don't see how that technology takes that away. Yeah, well, I think the key thing is, is that this, this influence, this helping, as we talk about it, is really contextual. That's right. And unique, yeah. Everybody. I mean, if there's seven billion people in the world, there's seven billion different customers. Exactly. Um, so being able to uh, synthesize what you're getting from all these data points you're getting from from the stakeholders in, in the decision, right? Uh, and synthesize it into something that's that's coherent, that's differentiated. That's yeah, going to be hard, I think, for machines to do that for quite some time. Yeah, I agree. And and that's that's kind of what I want to emphasize to sales professionals is sure, I mean, you know, have an idea of where where robots and machine learning and all those things are going and if and how it's going to impact you, but don't be don't let it be something that makes you afraid or overwhelms you so that you lose sight of what you do because what you do when you're a good salesperson is you are differentiating because you are focusing on that customer's need. Right? A, a good salesperson, like you just said, they they're there to help. Um I like to look at it as, you know, in pre-sales, for example, a salesperson, until that deal is signed, that salesperson is the biggest advocate for that customer success. And the minute that deal is signed, and if that if that salesperson continues to care about that customer, there's a point in time where that customer becomes an advocate for that salesperson because it's a very human interaction. Like you, you've influenced them to a point where they recognize that you're there for them. Now they feel like they're going to be there for you, and and how they can do that. So I think there's just so much of the human nature at play in sales. Well, yeah, I think the 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 critical thing is is, and Jeffrey Colvin wrote about this in his book "Humans Are Underrated." Is is, mm-hmm. yeah, how, what are those intangible human qualities that will differentiate you uh, going forward? Will put you in a position to better help the customer, and how do you how do you amplify those? Right, because empathy is first and foremost. One is, yeah. and he talks about that in his book. Is a quote from. An executive, I think, at Oracle, saying that you know empathy will be the key, the key sales skill of the 21st century. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is interesting because I, I, you know, have a concern that that may be true. And I'm not concerned that it may be true. I think it may be very well be true. The concern is that most people don't understand what it is and how to use it. That's right. And when they when they think they're quote unquote trained or they've developed the practice, it comes off as scripted. I think that's a big challenge that we face. I mean, there's this ongoing argument forever that is empathy something that you can teach. And so for me, I'm taking a step back, the way I look at when I wrote this book, I did not want to be someone who created a methodology or put together all these detailed steps or had, you know, different documents for XYZ. I wanted it to be a book that spoke to salespeople and helped them think about how they had to approach sales. And that thought process is, you know, serving that customer. And I think that's that's the most important thing because if you are serving your customer, then you you're safe. I mean, if you're serving them in a way that's unique to them and unique to who you are and what you stand for and creating that personalized value, robots can't get to that right now. Well, yeah, well, I think this is this is a sort of critical thing that you bring up, which is that you know, increasingly we operate in a sales environment that is uh, dictated by process and technology and and because uh, that people feel more comfortable in that environment, right? Yeah. Tell me the steps. Yeah, I don't want to have to think about it. Just tell me the steps. That's right. And so if, I think we have to sort of come up with this this mix of prescription and and uh, mindfulness for people to really think, yeah, how in this environment, because there's gonna be, I think as we see AI and machine learning come in, we're seeing initially now it's on more more taking more repetitive tasks off the table for sellers to try to give them more time in front of customers. Right. 
not sure that will necessarily work, but um, <laughs> assuming it does to some you degree, exactly. Yeah, is is yeah. What are the things in their mind? And this is where I think where the role of sales managers come in. And yeah. I think that we've seen a failure on this part is to say, 100%. how do we really prepare you going forward? And what are the things you need to work on as an individual contributor to get ready to operate in this changing environment? Yeah. Yeah. And how do I, and for the gaps that I find, first of all, let me care enough to learn what those gaps are. And once I find them, what am I going to do to help address them so that these people do have a chance and they are able to evolve? The empathy one, I think that's the best, single best example that we have for this type of conversation. It's that, you know, you can't fake empathy um, or sincerity for that matter. And it's not something that's innate. Well, people try. A lot of people. Yeah, people, that's, that's where I was going. It's not innate in most people. But if you give them a script or if you give them a methodology or a series of steps that can help them um, be empathetic, that's not going to work very well um, because it's not coming from a place that's genuine. Right? I do believe that people can become more empathetic by just training themselves to think that way. But I don't think that that's something that you can give them on a piece of paper artificially. You have to help them think why empathy is so important. For example, if you you go in and do a discovery, people can do a discovery and gather a lot of information. But somebody who's highly empathetic can get the baseline information they need to make the sale, but they'll also hear concern about, you know, if that person's worried about their job. Are they concerned that, um, you know, there's going to be a merger that's going to displace them? Those types of things you can sense with empathy. You can't sense that with a script of questions in discovery. And so that's one of the things that's so important in discovery with these high impact questions is it's not that it teaches you empathy, but it reminds you that you have to ask the questions that allow you to feel that emotion and sense where that customer's at. You have to be able to look at life from where they're sitting. And it's amazing to me how hard that is for some people. Well, but again, I think that gets to the challenge of sort of framing what what empathy really is. I mean, there's... Yeah whole you know dialogue that exists in terms of difference between you know compassionate empathy and cognitive empathy and so on. And I tend to come down more on the side of cognitive empathy, which is yeah, we we give our sellers personas of what you know mm-hmm. of our target customers and this is what they're feeling. And and I think that you know people want to go in and, and say, yeah, I, I, I feel how you feel, right? And as opposed to saying, I understand why you feel the way you do, which as you're alluding to to some degree in, in your book is and I think that's that is an important distinction is is it's okay to feel the emotion, but you really if you want to be effective for them, if you want to help them, you need to understand why they feel the way they do. That's right. It's the motivator, right? So what is that situation or that context that's making them react the way that they do and and the emotions that they have? So a lot of times um, you know, customers are just afraid because if you think about it, when you're making these large technology purchases purchases, excuse me, it's a it's a huge investment for that company. And a lot mm-hmm. of careers are made and broken on, you know, large technology purchases that failed. And so the amount, just the amount of fear that that individual who's accountable for the overall buying process feels is huge. And so to go in there and and not recognize that is foolish because you have to be able to account for that fear. And how are you going to address that fear? But what, when it becomes more powerful is when you're having a conversation with that customer and you understand the degree of that fear because you are able to be empathetic with them and you know, try to sense where where their head is at in terms of how much is this fear? Is it debilitating? Should I just leave because they're just not going to make a decision on this? Or, you know, these are the types of things that are making them scared, to your point, right? What's what's making that happen? And then how do I address those things that are making them scared? Mm-hmm. Well, and you compound that with the fact that I believe that most sellers, uh, though some grow out of this, obviously, is also operate from a position of fear. Yeah. So when you have fear, confronting fear, it, it can make for oh, gosh. a lack of progress. Yeah. Yeah. Fear. And the other one that I really um, dislike and I feel sad when people have that is this sense of desperation. I think when you've got a sales professional who maybe isn't making the numbers to the degree that they are expected to, then they start to make really bad choices when they're in the deal, right? Like they may, they may ignore the fact that this is not a customer who's going to make a decision or it's not the decision maker, for example. Mm -hmm. I think things that can, that can impact your own ability to be empathetic, right? Because if you're so much in your head 
and you're undergoing something, that's going to probably overshadow your ability to recognize what that customer is going through. If it's something that's super powerful like that, if I'm a salesperson and I'm worried that this deal is going to make or break my career at this company, I'm going to behave very differently than a salesperson who's got this long, kind of this long view of how to work with customers. And so I think there's a little bit of that at play too. We can teach them all day. We can teach sales professionals, you know, these thought processes and what they should be considering. But when they're in that moment, who they are, what they're going through is a huge factor in how that conversation goes. Yeah, well, there's this interesting conundrum that exists. On one hand, you have employers decrying the idea that that salespeople turn over so quickly. Yeah. But on the other hand, yeah, salespeople are turning over so quickly because of the environment. Right. So, yeah. you know, that is that is sort of the push me pull you that that really needs to be resolved, and it's getting worse. I mean, if we're having uh, sellers. As in some cases, I think in in certain tech segments, our average tenure is sixteen months. You know, sixteen to eighteen months. Yeah. You can make the argument that they haven't learned anything. Yeah, it's true, and that's why a lot of the learning that you have to do it does have to be kind of on yourself because a lot of companies don't provide that learning. And you know, it's interesting if I look at these sales professionals and they do have a short tenure. I mean, the question for that leadership team becomes: What was it about this environment that that makes us churn these sales professionals so quickly? And this is where I think that the whole field of sales enablement has a huge opportunity. Um, and so, you know, I talk about I'm shifting gears a little bit, but when I look sure. at sales enablement, um, I look at sales enablement leaders and sales enablement team members as sales professionals that are selling to the sales organization in the company. Essentially, that sales organization is the customer of sales enablement. And so sales enablement people have to start focusing more on how do I make this environment something that is um, positive for these sales professionals? And by the way, you're not going to get that in some data or in some book. You're going to get that by listening to these um, salespeople and figuring out what it is that is blocking them from being so successful that they don't want to leave. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, gosh, yeah, that could be a whole other podcast just on that. <laughs> um, yeah, because who's responsible for culture? And I think that's, that's right. I don't think that's sales enablement. I think it's leadership. Um, sales enablement can certainly, you know, reinforce it and play a role in that. But and they can guide it. I think they can guide it as well. If they know the sales team well enough, they can be the advocate for that sales team and that culture that needs to grow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I and mean, the gosh, I say, it's a whole conversation of what yeah. sales enablement Sorry, is just, and I, should I, be. I and, think of that. That's okay. <laughs> then come back, we'll talk about it again. But um, well, good. Well, we are sort of just out of time. So how um, how can people learn more about you? So most of the um, work I do online is on LinkedIn. So you can just find me on LinkedIn, Anita Nielsen, author, and I'll pop right up. I do some, I tweet sometimes, but I'm not as uh, as keen on it as I as I could be. But if you reach out to me on LinkedIn, I'm happy to connect. I, I always love to learn from sales professionals and sales leaders. I like to stay close to um, what people are going through so that I can try to help them the best I can. Perfect. And your book's just available everywhere? Amazon, yeah, Amazon's probably the quickest way to get it. My website is ldkadvisory.com, and that has a ton of information about the book. It's got like an audio sample, um, so you can check out some more information there. Perfect. All right. Well, Anita, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, friends, that's it for this episode. First of all, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to it. i also so grateful for your support of the show. And I want to thank my guest, Anita Nielsen, for sharing her insights with us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast, Sales Enablement with Andy Paul, on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you could also leave us a rating or review, let us know how we're doing. Well, we'd certainly appreciate that. And you can do that all on your phone in less than a minute as soon as this episode is over. So thanks for your help. And thank you so much for investing your time with me today. Until next time, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Companies spend over $20 billion on sales training every year. 
But if you ask the average rep how they learn to sell, the answer is almost always not training, but rather a great coach. This October, we're going to prove the value of sales coaching once and for all by finding the best sales coaches in the world. Introducing Top Sales Coach 2020, hosted by Ring DNA and the Sales Enablement Podcast with Andy Paul. This is your chance to win the prestige of being named a top sales coach, a $1,000 grand prize, and the opportunity to receive feedback from some of the top sales leaders and coaching experts in the world. Enter the competition in three easy steps. Step one, choose one of three pre-recorded sales calls at topcoach.ringdna.com. Step two, record a one to two minute video coaching the rep from your call of choice. Step three, submit your video and wait for the votes to start rolling in. Go to topcoach.ringdna.com and battle for the sales coaching crown.